Georgian, we appreciate it. Um, this topic is not really spoken about in, in mainstream media anyway. Um, I saw the movie American Circumcision. I think that's mm -hmm. what it's called. Yeah. And then that's what kind of piqued our interest. Um, and then we started looking, like even if you try to search on Instagram about male circumcision or follow accounts, you can't, you don't really see a lot of it um, or any information. So that movie where especially the parts where it showed the babies being strapped down and Velcroed in was just awful. Those, those images are, are sickening. So this definitely piqued our interest and that's why we decided to reach out. So for our listeners, can you introduce yourself sure. um, and give your credentials and let everyone know who we're talking to? Sure. Uh, I'm George Ann Chapin and I am 70 years old. I've been a healthcare executive for four decades and I, I ran a Medicaid health plan in New York. I've worked mostly in the nonprofit sector. And since 2009, I've been the executive director of Intact America, an organization that works to change the way America thinks about circumcision. Um, I have a master's degree uh, in sociomedical sciences from Columbia University. I have an undergraduate degree uh, in anthropology, and I also have a law degree. So um, I'm an attorney. I was ad admitted to the bar in New York State, but I have never formally practiced law. That's very impressive. And yeah. my biggest credential is that I have worked on this issue for I've believed in it since I was knew about it when I was 10 years old, that we shouldn't be cutting up little baby boys. And I've been working on it uh, formally for, well, probably the last 20, close to 25 years. So what got, you said you were 10 years old when you first learned about it. How did that come to fruition? Um, my brother, I had a brother who was born when I was 10 and he had a, I, I mean, I'd never heard the word circumcision. I don't even think I had ever seen a naked boy. Um, and um, I remember him coming home from the hospital with a bloody penis. And I just thought that was creepy mm. <laughs> and then he had then there was a big panic in the family and he had to go back to the doctor N none of this was talked about right and uh it turned and then i remember my my parents coming home and my mother was very traumatized and they told us that his penis had closed up and he wasn't able to urinate so they had to reopen it and my mother had to hold him while that was going on. So in later terms, my, my youngest brother had two unanesthetized penis surgeries when he was just a couple days old. And it stuck with me, but I didn't really know what it was about. And then, um, uh, I don't know, a decade later, a little more maybe, I, I just... People started talking about female genital mutilation, maybe, maybe it's 15 years later. And I thought to myself, well, we do that to boys. You know, what's like, why are we all, I mean, I, I think female genital cutting is horrible, but we do it to boys. Every boy is a target. And I remember getting into it with people I knew, you know, really like liberal public health people, feminists, our bodies, ourselves, female autonomy, and thinking, but we're mutilating all these baby boys. And that's how I got into it. And then I'll, I'll finish this quickly. Um, I had a son, 1980. As I've said many times, we no more would have considered cutting his penis than we would have poked out one of his eyes. It wasn't an issue in our marriage. And, um, and that's what we did. And we really never talked about it. Uh, you don't really talk about yeah, hopefully your child's genitals as they're growing up. It's not really any more than you would talk about oh, the shape of their earlobe or something. And uh, when he was 18, we were on a road trip, he and I, and um, there had been a kind of a family. We were visiting some extended family and there had been like a lot of hullabaloo the day before all the guys were in the living room and I had walked in and heard him, um, he, he was standing up and he was saying, you guys just don't know what you're missing. And I realized they were having an argument about, I figured they were having an argument. So the next day we we're in the car and I said, you know, what was that about? And he said, oh, you know, you don't, 
Are you, this is unbelievable. Um, he said, these guys just, they're like the dude who bought a Cadillac and can't admit he got a lemon. Um, and he said, the difference is, you know, he can trade his Cadillac in and they can't do a thing about it. And then he said to me, I never thanked you and dad for not circumcising me. And I just want to thank you. Mm. And I went there from being aware and thinking circumcision was like stupid, uh, painful, um, hypocritical, all of those sort of more on an intellectual plane, right? To realizing that it had a lifelong impact and keeping the the body part you're born with, the foreskin, the most, ex- the most important part of our bodies, parts, are our genitals and, and our mouth, right? We eat to live and we have sex to procreate or, and, and pleasure, right? You have to, it has to be, ple- both of them have to be pleasurable for people to want to do them, right? So here we were deprived, here is my 18 year old son, not giving me any detail, but saying how happy he was to have a foreskin. Um, And I just realized that what we were doing was far more significant than just another kind of, you know, hypocrisy or mindful mindlessness. And that's how I got into it. And then I I was, um, then I went to law school and right after that, I think I was just getting ready to start law school at the age of 47, 48. And I spent my whole time in law school researching circumcision and it's legal and ethical and international health law, refugee law, everywhere where, where genital cutting came up and um, wrote some papers about it and met people who were in the movement who had been working on the issue for the last, for the, to then the past, since like the seventies, but I wasn't aware of them. And I met them and got involved. And then when, this Texas donor uh, came forward to a my predecessor in another organization. She suggested that I get involved. And so I did the initial groundwork to start Intact America, which uh, your listeners should know is intactamerica.org is our website. We're also on Facebook, Insta. Um, we have a great YouTube page and we have uh, we're on Twitter and you can find out all about us. And then we also have a, another site called circumcisiondebate.org and with that we have a facebook page there too and that's for people who think they want to know something but aren't really quite sure not quite into it just Mm. thinking about it that's the 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 debate side we personally don't believe there's any debate i mean how are you going to debate someone and say it's a good thing to cut off part of somebody's (laughs) penis i mean it doesn't make any sense right not when you put it that way I yeah. was, I was gonna, and, and that's what it is, right? Yeah. It, I mean, if you say it that way, it kind of it should end the conversation. But you mentioned, you know, uh, being exposed to that pretty early in life. Um, do you think your your mother was doing it for religious reasons or was it just a, like something that everybody's doing or was it? Aesthetics? 1950. They didn't even ask. My, my, uh, my mother's second husband who raised me, my father, um, is anti-circumcision. And yet that was his only son, only, only natural son. We have an adopted brother also. Um, he said, George Ann, they didn't even ask. We talked talk about it later, years later. So they never asked, they just did it. Um, by the mid sixties, early seventies, um, informed consent as poorly as it is carried out for this, cause baby, no baby consents. Um, and as much as circumcision is coerced, but at least there was a pretense and a mother's signature, you know, on a consent form was solicit was asked for. But in 1950, no, 1960, when he was born, 62, um, no. And my generation born in 1950, early 50s, nothing. Every, every man I knew when I was, you know, all my peers, as far as I knew, once I became aware of this, they were all cut. Mm. And many parents I've talked to said the same thing. Never, never even asked. Can you talk about the history of circumcision? When I was looking into this, so I watched the movie and then I went down a wormhole on it. I was reading that uh, at the turn of the 19th century, there was a doctor that said 
It could cure like migraines. It could cure syphilis. <laughs> it could yeah. it, it, like crazy shit that has nothing to do with your penis. Can you talk yeah. about how it started? Oh, hey. This podcast episode is brought to you by BCN Supplements. BCN Supplements is a Texas-based company that produces and manufactures everything right here in the great United States of America. The good thing is BCN caters to every single person on the fitness spectrum, whether you're a seasoned hybrid athlete, kind of like myself, or you're a newbie just now starting to pay attention to your health, kind of like Mike. BCN has what you need to make a healthy choice. Lately, I've been using BCN's pre-workout mix, and to be honest, I'm not really a pre-workout guy because I don't like the way most on the market make you feel, you know, the crash and that tingly feeling, but you don't get any of that junk with BCN's pre-workout mix. I've noticed I had more focus during my lifts and more energy to carry through my longer workouts. And that pump you get is just, it's amazing. Drop what you're doing right now and go to bcnsubs.com to place your order today on this pre-workout mix. They got vitamins and they got collagen and be sure to use promo code CWJM to receive 10% off your next purchase. BCN Supplements, helping build a better you from the inside out. Yeah, that was that was like the actually the mid to late 19th century. So 1870s, 50s, 70s, 80s, right? Uh, yeah. So they didn't know what caused most diseases. And they're always looking for new theories. And um, and there was also, you know, this was the Victorian era in, in England and the United States, Australia, the English speaking countries. And there's a lot of prudery. And masturbation was thought to be uh, a terrible thing because it it used up the energies of of the person, male or female, female, male, but particularly male masturbation because they were spilling their seed, they were you know <laughs> wasting their energy, and and it dissipated men's strength, and it was and it took them away from their you know, the pursuits, they should be their studies and their work and all of those things, these, you know, these poor helpless boys just <laughs> masturbated all day. Um, <laughs> so they re- realize, and, and by the way, uh, Jewish circumcision also has a history like that. So Maimonides, who was a rabbi and a physician in the 12th, 11th, 13th century, um, said that, uh, that circumcision helped boys focus on their studies because it was less pleasurable to, you know, they wouldn't masturbate. They would instead focus on their studies. Um, and also girls liked intact boys better. He didn't use the word intact. My mom, I don't know what word he would have used. I don't know what language he was speaking in. Um, but that women preferred men with foreskins. Uh, and so they, there was just too much, you know, sex for pleasure going on. And if you wanted to focus on procreation and, and, you know, sticking to your work and your studies, you, you needed to, to circumcise the boys. So that's what um, a number of English and American physicians started doing. And they, they targeted teenagers, adolescents, because they were the ones who were most overtly masturbating. And as this was taking hold, as this was, they, they had these claims, like you said, like, like it cured insanity. <laughs> I had the most remarkable experience with a patient. He couldn't walk. And all of a sudden his hip dysplasia went away. Um, You know, blindness. Um, So these, it took on a life of its own with all these medical justifications. And that has continued really unabated. So as each, as a, as a solution has been found or as an explanation has been found for all these these illnesses, right? Like um, tuberculosis wasn't caused by masturbation and couldn't be prevented by masturbation. So it's caused by the tubercular bacilli or something. Um, There would be a new condition or problem that circumcision would solve or prevent. And then as medical specialties developed and the birth process was taken away from women, really, before that you had midwives, a lay midwives delivering babies and male obstetricians took over. They would, you know, drug the mothers, put, you know, like immobilize them, drag the baby out with forceps and circumcise the boys. So it became a 
medical procedure, which initially was a symbol of affluence because only wealthy women had their babies in hospitals in the early part of the 20th century. And then, and then it moved into the mainstream. By the 1940s, uh, England was giving it up because they didn't have any money after the Second World War and they had a national health service and they listened to the doctors that said, this is crazy, this is not medically helpful. Um, subsequently, New Zealand gave it up. Australia gave it up later. Um, Canada is kind of half and half, but the United States, um, the circumcision prevalence in the world is Muslims first, because they're the biggest group that circumcises, um, then Americans, and then everybody else, um, including Jewish people. So Americans are, we estimate that probably 75% of adult men, let's say men over the age of you know 25 or 30, are walking around with that important part of their penis missing. Do you, for the conspiracy theorists out there, including myself, do you think there's an underlying objective with this? Like, uh, do you think, you know, because obviously the, the cutting wasn't curing diseases. The only thing I could think of maybe is that if it was unclean, you could get a UTI and it does do some pretty psychological things depending on how severe a UTI is. But other than that, do, through your studies, have you seen anything that looked a little off? Like uh, Well, line everything looks of? off about something like this, right? Because it's so, it's so devastatingly damaging to half of the human race, right? Um, but uh, the UTI thing, by the way, you know, babies, there's a, possibly a slightly greater risk of UTIs in intact boys, but there are good reasons to believe that some of that has to do with adults fiddling with the foreskin. Um, there are There is no epidemiological evidence from anywhere in the world, countries with where 100% or not, most men are intact, people aren't dropping from dead from UTIs. Um, you know, Washington State, which has a much lower circumcision rate than Illinois, doesn't have a UTI problem uh, among boys and men. So that's also been hyped uh, over the years. And uh, UTIs can, as girl, UTIs are much more common in girls than in boys and can be treated with, you know, $2.15 worth of antibiotics. So let's put the UTI thing aside. As far as cleanliness, a boy's foreskin is uh, stuck to the head of his penis, just like your fingernail stuck to your, to your finger, right? With this synechial tissue. And unlike the fingernail, which hopefully for all of us stays stuck to our fingers, um, for men, the foreskin over time separates and it's the hormones of puberty, if it hasn't separated before, it's the hormones of puberty that makes it separate. But its function and the reason it's stuck to the head of the penis is for protection. Um, that's keep to keep uh, pathogens out of the urinary tract. So that is why baby boys have type four skins. And that's why even the AAP, which is pretty pro-circumcision still, despite acknowledging it's not medically necessary, even the AAP absolutely unequivocally says a boy's foreskin should never be forcibly retracted. So, so do I think there's something off? Yeah. Um, conspiracy. Yes. As with lots of cultural things though, it's, it becomes so embedded that it's not like doctors are sitting around the table saying, you know, let's go get foreskins. You know, um, uh, we want to hear that though. Right? Right. You know, yeah, like, mo ah, most ah, ah, most male doctors in the United States are are because of the demographic are bound to be circumcised, right? So most of them have likely never seen an intact penis. Uh, they've never experienced it themselves. Most of the women in their life. This is changing, especially due to immigration. Oh yeah, but um, and and to you know, declining rates of circumcision, although we don't know exactly how much has declined, but uh, most intact men I know who are my son's age or younger, he's 41, um, with whom I've spoken to about this and probably 
kind of funny, you know, here you're known among your son's friends as somebody, <laughs> who, right? um, you know, have said, oh, you know, I met this girl and she was really shocked, you know, that I was in, I was the first in tech guy she saw or, or, or she told me the best lover she'd ever had. Like it's in the dialogue now it's in the, um, but what remains true about circumcision is we live in a country where every medical procedure is paid for, even the ones that aren't needed, paid for by somebody. And circumcision is a fee-for-service procedure. Most doctors are intact or pro-intact or, um, and they, and the hospitals and the insurance companies and the coding and everything is set up. So circumcision is a norm. It's a normal, it'd be like, you know, it's like, it's a norm as much as you go into a restaurant and you've got, you know, the forks on the left and the knife and the spoon on the right. <laughs> and somewhere that started, but we don't even know. And if you said, you know, why is that? Someone would say, well, that's our culture. It's like, uh, yeah, but like, why is the spoon on the right? Like, <laughs> couldn't the spoon be on the left? Um, give, you know, little kids the silverware and see where they put it, you know, like, use, your, use their fingers, right? Um, so it's just embedded in our society as a normal thing to do. And that's really tragic because it causes so much pain and suffering. You talked about, it's interesting that America is the, the one, you know, the, the, you know, the industrial country that, that practices it the most. Let me get my speech here. But even culturally inside the U S I can remember being inside high school and I'm not circumcised, but I was the only one and myself and another Hispanic were the only ones who weren't right. circumcised. So it's interesting, the contrast in, inside the country. I think it's widely practiced among you know, white people. Um, and I'm not sure about African-Americans, but I, it's, I don't know any Hispanics that are circumcised. And I've well, asked. <laughs> interestingly, um, the circumcision machine does target blacks and Latinos uh, more. We did a survey a couple of years ago and we found that that the average number of times expectant moms were at expectant or child birthing moms, you know, even in the hospital were asked if they wanted their son circumcised. And that's from, would you like him circumcised to you're circumcising him, right? Are you sure you don't want him circumcised? You know, that range, right? Everybody does it. Um, the average number of times it was brought up was eight Mm. Uh, per person and black and and latinx moms were asked more frequently than white moms uh so maybe because they were perceived as being resistant maybe they were maybe they were perceived as being like less careful less clean um all of the judgments the completely erroneous ideas about what circumcision does that it keeps the baby clean. I mean, what's clean about an open wound in a diaper? <laughs> you know, um, nothing is clean about that. Um, what's dirty about intact genitals? I mean, girls' genitals are more complicated to wash than boys' genitals. And we don't start, and in fact, countries that practice female genital cutting use that as a rationale. Um, they get rid of all those folds and stuff. Mm. Um, so, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So then if the implication is, um, don't you want to be more American? Um, <laughs> I, I, I had a, don't you, you know, don't like, don't you want your son to be clean? Um, boys are pigs. They're so disgusting. They can't. You know, you, you you don't want if he's not going to wash his genitals, you have to teach him how to wash his genitals. Well, the genitals are probably the most pleasurable thing to wash. Right. Um, most <laughs> true. people true. probably like don't it. have trouble with that. Um, so. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and, and this is such a deep topic. You know, um, we're doing we have a conference in Atlanta in August and we're doing a panel on race and uh, one of, and this is one of the subjects because where there's prejudice or discrimination or stereotypes and all that, you're going to find 
that circumcision is one of those things, you know, uh, that's going to come up, you know? So, uh, if, if you're a, if you're a culture that is being thought of as negligent or dirty or poor or heedless or, or sex, having excess sexual appetite, um, you'll have a circumcision narrative that's being laid on that culture. So in, in the early part of the 20th century, late 19th, early 20th, there was a doctor named Peter Remondino, um, well-published head of, I forget what state's medical society. And he published, and there's still a book out by him that you still get it like on Amazon. You know, he's been dead for a hundred years, probably. Uh, and he calls for universal circumcision of black men to end what he called the Negro rape crisis. So to stop black men from raping white women, they should be circumcised. And of course, that's what we're doing in Africa right now, the United States and is supporting the circumcision campaigns in sub-Saharan Africa. And I, I, I call it castration campaigns there. Um, they say that it's gonna keep men from getting HIV. They're not even claiming it keeps men from giving HIV to women but they're not testing the man who they're circumcising. So you don't know if they're HIV positive, but circumcising him and telling him this will, this will lower your chances of getting HIV from one of those dirty women over there. But meanwhile, the men could be, so this Mm -hmm. is going on now in the third world um, and supported by American medicine and public health. Does it make sex less desirable? Like the, are you less, are you less, um, are you going to want to have sex less? I mean, shoot me straight. I'm, uh, I don't, I'm, circ- I don't I'm circumcised, think- right? So right, right. What, what am I, what am I missing out on here? Well, you know, only, you know, your libido, right? So if it's like wanting to have sex, um, people that's, that's your libido. That's your sexual desire. But are you missing something? Yeah. You're missing part of your penis, right? <laughs> and that part of your penis that you're missing I mean, you're literally missing something, right? So that's not a value. That's a that's a fact. So then you would ask, what is it that that part of my, my that part of my body that I'm missing has that I'm missing? And it's nerve endings, muscle, um, blood vessels. You know, I mean, that would be like to say you're missing nothing would be like you know I cut off you know this much of my cut off the my index finger down to the first knuckle and say, well, and I say, well, you're missing sensation and that thing. Well, no, I'm not missing anything because I have nine other. F- yeah, but you are because you're missing with this one finger. Right. So there are other points of pleasure, but the most n- nerve laden um, part of the penis is the foreskin and it's double layered and the inner layer is mucosal tissue and the outer layer is more like regular skin. And the inner layer keeps the head of the penis moist. The head of the penis does not have the number of nerve endings that the foreskin has. Um, and the foreskin, uh, so it protects the head of the penis, men who have, um, men who are intact, the head of their penis will be pinker, more moist, than the head of the penis of a man who isn't, uh, did I say that right? The, yeah. If you're intact, right? Then a head of a penis of a man who was circumcised. Over time, the, the penis of a circumcised man becomes drier and keratinized, a layer of almost like a callus builds up. So, and then you're also missing the gliding action of the, cir- of the foreskin. So the foreskin, provides you know, what we call extra skin. And that's why we want to take it off. Think about a turtle's neck, right? <laughs> like, is that extra skin? Cause he pulls it back under his shell and then he pokes it out. Would you remove all those folds from a turtle's neck? I mean, you would be completely inhibit his function, right? Mm. Um, that's one reason they call foreskin's turtleneck. Um, <laughs> and um, so, yes, you are now, whether you, what the extent of the damage done to your penis um, varies immensely uh, depending on um, who did it, how they did it, 
you know, whether they had beginning of their day or the end of their day, the size of the baby's penis, the shape of the baby's penis. Let's take, so let's take a look. Let's see what, you, yeah. see what you're working with here. You guys can do that when I'm not. <laughs> um, uh, so it should know, have been longer, right? Bigger, <laughs> thicker. So, you know, golly. yeah. I, um, circumcised penises are on an average, a fraction of an inch shorter than intact penises. Oh my gosh. I, but you also lose girth, right? Because remember what I said, it's a double layer of skin and that retracts that skin pulls back when you're having intercourse or when you're masturbating, but it's still there. It's not been removed, right? So it's somewhere, it's somewhere. It's sort of like, you know, uh, when women used to wear girdles, they could squeeze the girdle on, but the the, the blubber would like pop up to the top of the girdle. There's still right? some there, right? I'm, I'm calling my mom after this. I'm going to give her a piece of my mind. Listening, yeah. listening to you talk, you know, so I work <laughs> out and I grab the bar and I'm lifting weights and I, I develop a callus on my hands. So I imagine circumcised men, like if your penis is rubbing, a, you know, on your jeans, your I imagine underwear, you, yeah, right. your yeah. underwear, I imagine yeah. you have some type of, of, a buildup of something, maybe not a callus, but there's something because, you yeah. know, getting a little personal here, like you said that there's not an, there's not a lot of nerve endings on the tip of the penis, but I'm very sensitive, like extremely sensitive on the tip of my penis. Whenever me and my wife are getting the, you know, oh, all right. <laughs> doing the deed, you know, I like, I saw, are you talking about the, the foreskin or the head of your penis? Well, both like the foreskin, right. like you said, right. is, it all works together by the way. Yeah. Right. That's the whole thing. The whole thing works together. Right. Just like you can't really talk about your hand independently, you can, but it works, you know, with your wrist and your arm and it's all one thing, right? So when you remove a section, you've, re you've actually altered the function of the rest of it. Mm. How, yeah. what kind of, like, how is this still going on and so prevalent? What kind of uh, feedback or what kind of uh, support do you get from the general public? When you do these organizations, when these rallies are going on, do, do people kind of wake up to, I imagine people being very uh, kind of objective to it, especially if they've been circumcised, like there's nothing wrong with me. What are you talking about? Like right. you're, you're different because you're not circumcised. Like what kind of feedback do you get? That's a big problem, you know, because um, I get, I get a lot of inquiries. Intact America does. You can write to me, by the way, info at intactamerica.org if you have any questions. Um, you know, it's a big deal when with pregnant women, they'll say, you know, I can't believe it. My husband, you know, I want, I want my baby not to be circumcised. And my husband's insisting that we circumcise him. Um, and I can't believe, you know, he's so mean that he wants to do this to our unborn son, you know, or yet as, and what I've started to say to people is, you know, when you say all the terrible things about circumcision as a justification or as a try to persuade your husband, he's thinking you're saying there's something wrong with him. So just be mindful of that, right? <clears throat> We've got a culture where, where most men are circumcised. And if you have ever, so defensiveness is the, Reaction I would describe as the most common among people who don't want to hear this message, right? So who's defensive? You're defensive if you've ever picked up a knife and circumcised a baby, right? Oh my God, how did I do that? I mean, most you know people won't say. You're defensive if you've signed off on having one of your children circumcised. And you're defensive if you are circumcised yourself. Like, you know, what's wrong with me? I mean, you might also feel angry. You might also feel victimized. But when you have this culture that this is done on this massive scale, people are not giving it up that easily. Uh, you need another kind of, you need other kinds of, of precipitating forces to make people give it up. A big one is funding. So if insurance companies pay for it and doctors sell it, um, I mean, why haven't cigarettes disappeared, right? Because they're being sold to, and, and there's an addictive sense, you know, addictive element to it. There are people who actually say that, um, 
I want to that that some doctors become certainly inured to cutting. I mean, if you've cut, I had a doctor come up to me at a medical convention and said, I want to be, I'm open-minded and I want to know more about this. And then he said, I'm the only doctor in my town, in my city in Maine. I do like 90% of the circumcisions in the, my city I live in, in Maine. And I estimate I've circumcised around seven or 8,000 babies. Whoa. Now, I have no idea if that number, that was like, didn't Will Chamberlain say he had slept with <laughs> like 45,000 women or something? I mean, I have no idea like, you know, I didn't calculate I how long him. he would. If, you what? I believe him. <laughs> okay. Right. Scored a lot of baskets. Well, I, believe, I believe this guy that he had done thousands of circumcisions. And um, I said to him, you know, you're asking me all these questions. Oh, and he told me his son was intact, which was mind boggling. Um, and I, I said, you know, you're asking me all these questions. And I'm going to ask you one. Why don't you stop? Why don't you stop? And he said, oh, stopping would be very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, once something takes hold, it's pretty hard to eradicate it, especially if money's involved, your own penis is involved, you did it to your son, you didn't do it, you know. Um, it's really, it's really tough. So, but people are getting tuned into this. For one thing, we're so lucky that we can have a show like this and we can talk like this openly, right? I mean, I know you're not network TV primetime, but still, right? This is accessible. Um, and also I think that men and women, it, it's a women's issue too, because women are ambushed at a very vulnerable time in their lives, which is childbirth. And their agency, their autonomy is infringed on. I mean, to ask someone for consent, to consent, here, would you sign here to allow us to cut off part of your baby boy's penis, which is going to impact him for the rest of his life and, um, have, an, and have an effect on his sexuality? I mean, they don't say that. They say, you know, sign here. Um, and a mother could be, you know, very exhausted. Countless stories of women being woke being woken up the morning after they give birth to, and asked to sign a consent form. Mm. Um, so, but, but people who hear our conversation, people who watch the movie American Circumcision, people who are just willing to question the status quo, and there are people like that. I mean, I think that's how I have been about many things. There's some people, you guys too, you're social critics. You know, you have a podcast called Curiosity, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's those qualities make people more open to facing unpleasant questions and answering them not necessarily to their own favor. You you mentioned cost, and I guess I never thought about that. Have you ever estimated the uh, the cost of the procedure? Well, we are now using the figure. $2 billion a year. So there's a market um, for that then. That, yeah. That's a very um, fuzzy amount because the costs are from the initial circumcision, right? Which could run between in a very poor state, um, Medicaid, you know, $75 up to the thousands. Uh, if you want like the most prestigious urologist in Los Angeles to cut off part of your son's penis. Um, and then there are also the uh, facility costs, right? I mean, you have a room in a hospital devoted to this procedure. Maybe they do a couple other procedures, but you have in a big hospital, like assembly line circumcision, you have staff devoted to that, right? You have nurses, I mean, trained nurses, who are spending their time strapping down a baby boy so that somebody else can cut off part of his penis. You have supplies, you have gauze and Vaseline and all of that. Then you have, and this is the biggie that is completely not enumerated, all of the repairs because circumcision has immediate complications and it has also long-term, but even the immediate complications, Cosme, cosme, cosmesis, cosmetic complication. Oh, I don't like the way it looks. 
they cut more off the left side than the right side. Oh, well, let's do a revision. Mm. So the kid goes back in for another one. Um, uh, the what, what my brother went through, the closing up of the urethra. Um, and then those actually persist into, into adulthood, some of those complications. And some of them, of course, never get resolved. They're not all fixable. Um, most of them are not fixable, actually. So I don't think we that I think we said four billion dollars, you know, when you include adult complications. We don't really know. Um, I put in a proposal to a health foundation to calculate the cost in the first year of life of the most common pediatric surgery, which is uh, un medically unnecessary. So I described it, circumcision. Um, and just the cost to the state of that. And they actually made a special call to me to tell me that they weren't even moving it to the committee because uh, it was too controversial. I just mm. want to know, we want to know the cost. Wouldn't you want to know the cost of the most common and unnecessary pediatric surgery? Mm. Uh, but I guess the answer was no, we don't want to know that. How many debauches occur per circumcision? Like out of, if a group of 10 babies are circumcised, are, is there a number within that 10 that goes wrong? It depends on who you believe. The American Academy of Pediatrics uses a very, very, very tiny number. Um, you know, like maybe 2%, so two out of a hundred. Um, but then they say, but they don't, that just depends on how you define complications. And then it also says that risks and complications have never been systematically studied. Uh, we believe it's higher than that, a lot higher than that. Um, perhaps 20 to 30% have some kind of adverse consequence in the first few days of life, um, how many proceed to functional uh, impairment, um, how many proceed to, you know, complaints of painful intercourse, bleeding during intercourse. I mean, I get, we get letters too, you know, my, every time we have sex, my husband bleeds, um, uh, hair on the shaft of the penis, which can't be known that so much skin has been taken off that the scrotum has been pulled down onto the shaft of the penis. And that would become visible um, during puberty when body hair, when um, pubic hair and um, arm hair, hair, you know, uh, start to develop. Um, that's one of the most painful and not repairable um, complications of a too tight circumcision. I like to say every circumcision botches the penis, um, even the most perfect, cosmetically perfect circumcision. So um, the answer is a couple billion, you know, in a year. And, um, and then from there, we really don't know. I got screwed over, man. You got, <laughs> and, and, you know, I've said that I said, I, I, I used to run a managed care plan, a Medicaid managed care plan. And I say, would say to my colleagues, why don't we talk about just saying no to circumcision? And it's like, well, the state covers it. We're in New York. The state covers it. So, yeah, but, you know, we don't have to if it's not medically necessary. We're only supposed to cover medically necessary stuff. And I said, well, I said, wouldn't you rather have that money to spend on dental care for kids? Yeah. So I say, well, it's not that much money. So let's say it's only... It's only $500 million nationally, which we know it's more than that. $500 million give kids a lot of dental care. There are states where there's no, no dental benefit. No, Medicaid doesn't cover any dental care. Um, not to mention food, um, you know, uh, other things that people need, other medical things they need. Um, other necessities of life. So any dollar and, and public versus private money spent on circumcision, it's all public money. It's all the people's money, whether it's a private insurance company 
or the state is still it's taxpayers money or it's money that we as employees pay into an insurance plan, but it's all aggregated funds that could better be used for another purpose. Are there any concrete studies that really show that there is a benefit to get him snip? No, there's not. I know we nope. glossed over, nope. it, but there's no concrete. So no, every, every time there's a study, you know, there are people who claim it is like the UTI stuff, right? right? But one thing that's never done in the studies that claim benefit is, is an evaluation of the importance of the benefit in, in compa- taking into consideration the cost and the negative consequences, right? So you could, so, so penile cancer is more common in, in intact men than circumcised men. You have one in 100,000 men will develop penile cancer. You have eight in 100,000, no, you have eight in 100 women that will develop breast cancer, right? So, so we do these extreme things, cut off part of a baby's penis for these, for a UTI, which can be cured with simple antibiotics, or penile cancer, which virtually nobody ever sees and doesn't happen until someone's 90 years old. Um, and you've taken an important body part that has a sexual and pleasurable function and removed it from someone who can't consent. I mean, if you ask, I don't know, what would a baby, what would a, a little girl say if they're a 13 year old? They said, would you want me to cut off your breasts because you know it will reduce your chances of getting breast cancer? Um, you know, by that point, the girl's probably going to say, yeah, but, you know, I like my breasts and, or if she has a boyfriend, he likes her breasts, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, uh, and no, uh, we have a bumper sticker that says uh, um, 10 out of 10 boys say no to circumcision. So you're doing something for this putative kind of attenuated bullshit benefit, something that the person who's going to bear the consequences doesn't want. I, I think we kind of glossed over this and we didn't really get specific. How much of the foreskin is actually removed? I know that everyone does something different depending mm-hmm. on the doctor, depending on the circumstances, but how much is skin is actually removed from a baby's penis? Well, the amount of skin removes from a baby's penis, even if you remove all the foreskin, right? The entire foreskin and the frenulum, which is the um, part of the, the foreskin that keeps the, the foreskin from flopping around, just like your, your frenulum under your tongue keeps your tongue from flopping around, right? Um, it's from maybe just the, the end of the foreskin to an to the entire foreskin and the frenulum. That would be the range, right? Mm-hmm. Either way, it's not very big, right? It's just a little bit of skin. Because that's because it's a baby. Baby's heart's not very big either, right? But but when as the boy matures, the foreskin grows. And if you the average um, size of an adult male foreskin, and you have to picture sort of something unpleasant, like let's say it's cut off, unrolled, and opened, it's two layers, is around 12 to 15 square inches. Holy shit. Right. <laughs> what? Yeah. So imagine she- like from your, here, you can't see Let my me show you. <laughs> but imagine <laughs> this, right? This, 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 and this. Imagine a three by five index card, right? Because that is your, that is your foreskin, your foreskin, um, detached, unfolded, Um, and laid flat. And that's a hell of a lot of nerves, muscles, um, blood vessels. So so when you talk about, it's just a little flap of skin. Well, it's just a little finger too in a baby. I mean, the tip of the baby's toe is like, literally a snip you could take it off right yeah of course foreskin is not a snip that's a bullshit term because you have to peel that foreskin back from the penis you have to insert a metal probe (laughs) underneath it go around the head of the penis 
slit the foreskin and then take clamp it and then remove it with a cutting object. So the snip thing is complete crap. Um, it's a procedure that takes um, probably not counting strapping the child down and all of that 10 to 25 minutes. I've had nurses tell me that they saw circumcisions that took 25 minutes with the baby Shit. finally passing out. Right. Um, so this is a very invasive procedure and which sticks with many men for their lifetime. They have flashbacks, night terrors that they associate with their circumcision. You or I will never be able to tell them they do. That's, that's what it is or not. But many men re say they remember something about their circumcision it's laid down somewhere in the brain. Um, so that I, I went far afield from your question about how much skin is removed. The, the babies pass out sometimes. Yeah. So the babies, when you see someone says, Oh, my son slept through it. And they post a picture of their son mm -hmm. on Facebook. And the kid is like, like this, the kid initially, even, even the injection, even when they do use anesthetic, which is more common now than before, it's a, three injections into the base of the penis. So think about what that feels like in your mouth when you get numb, right? When they inject Novocaine. Um, and before, uh, recently, most circumcisions took place with absolutely no pain relief. Um, none, right? Yeah. So what was your question? I'm sorry. The baby's passing out. I didn't know they yeah. passed out. So babies will scream and shriek and sometimes choke on their own vomit um, and, and eventually go into shock. Um, especially in a prolonged circumcision. And this is all, you know, I'm not making any of this up. I didn't know any of this stuff when I was mouthing off about how hypocritical circumcision was. I found this all out after I got serious and became an activist. Um, and in fact, at the beginning, I, I didn't want to believe a lot of things that I now know to be all too true. Uh, I didn't want to believe in impaired lifetime sexual function. I, I just thought that was too horrifying. Um, to think that people, you know, women are mad at their husbands for pounding them. I just, ah, ah. well, in a circumcised man, the penis isn't functioning the way it's meant to function. So circumcised men need more friction and longer strokes and more resistant, more, more pounding. And usually for longer, they don't have the same feedback mechanism that an intact man has. And it's very unpleasant. It's not pleasant for the man. It's not pleasant for the, for the sex partner. So, you know, I don't know if I lived in Denmark or Sweden, if women complain about pounding, but I know it's a theme in mm. um, American advice, sex advice columns. And I've done a number of sex podcasts with um, people who talk about sexual function and sexual pleasure and, they agree that's a complaint they hear often. And, you know, how can you, and then that's the cause of discontent in, in romantic relationships. Um, and nobody knows why. You, why, how, why would we know why? We, we think that's normal. We talked about the frenulum. The, and I remember there's a guy in the documentary that says that you can actually come to orgasm just by touching the frenulum is the frenulum right. removed during circumcision it depends on the circumciser um part of it is is pretty much always removed and most of it is often removed and all of it is sometimes removed yeah. but even in men whose frenulum has been completely removed they report that the most sensitive part of their penis, if they touch it, is the is the scar is the scar where the frenulum was the frenular uh, scar. Do they cut at the base too, like on the bottom, like at a in a vertical motion parallel? Um, the four, I, the four. I don't know if I'm going to be able. I, I'm not an expert on circumcision technique, so you might want to go online and look up some of this stuff. You can find sites. <laughs> it'll give big warning, but the, the foreskin, I'm trying to think if there's something I can use to illustrate it. 
Um, I'm here. trying to figure this out, or maybe I peed on electrical fence. I don't know which one it was. <laughs> so it's always so, been a mystery. Oh, wait, um, so I'll say that. Are you talking about the? Say that again. Then. What's the last thing you said? I peed on electrical fence. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? Oh, well. What do you? Okay, so this is the foreskin, and on a you know on a, uh, an intact man, and so to circumcise a baby or a person, Pick this it up a little has bit. to be. Has yeah. to be cut vertically Pick and then bit. around. Pick it up a little bit. I can't see it. Oh, sorry. Oh, there no. It has to be. It has to be cut. You know, this is and it's closed at the tip, right? It's uh -huh. very narrow. It has to be cut like first. It has to be detached. Then it has to be cut vertically. Yeah, I have and that. Then with a scissor and then around. I have that vertical cut. I thought it was from peeing on a fence. Oh, really? So it never was. You mean you have it? I have uh, that vertical cut. You have a scar. A scar vertically. Well, that's that's okay. That's some kind of a uh, on oh, the head of your shit. penis. You have it <laughs> oh, shit. on the on the head of your penis. No, at the base. Well, like you have a like scar in the, like your... in the middle. Can you just pull it? So up? they they <laughs> must have they must have hit the head of your penis by accident. Yeah, it's, yeah the doctor yeah. said they took ten inches off me. <laughs> Wow. I'm just joking. Said, I wow. wish. Are you, I'm thinking, right, right. No, you don't. No, you don't wish. Um, I don't know. I don't know. A urologist could probably tell you what No, that's there's, about some, or, there's something, yeah. That that sounds like an accident to me. Oh, um, but, uh, but or maybe I, I peed know. on the fence. I'll just go with that. Well, okay, that's good. I'll just go Say that. Can you? It looks okay. Especially from especially if you're from Texas and you have all those, you know, yeah. all those, uh, it's a good, livestock it's wire a, fences. It's a good bar story. Right. But yeah. you know, you seriously, if, if you're interested in this and you obviously are, and you talk about going down the rabbit hole and getting obsessed, some, one of you in the podcast you did a couple of weeks ago, talk about, a, an, a, it becomes, it literally becomes an obsession. It does because it's like, how did I not know this? How could this have happened to me? How could this be something we're doing everywhere? How did I let this be done to my son? How did I, da, da, da. you know, it is, it grips you. I mean, I've been doing this work now and it doesn't get, it doesn't get any less fascinating because it's really extremely fascinating. The <laughs> implicate, and it doesn't get any less horrifying. In fact, it gets more horrifying. So, you know, spend a little time on, um, on some of the internet sites that are, you know, X rated that will give you really important information. It's really important to know this stuff. Yeah. It's just to think of a little baby, you know, you like you go, you know, if you have your own or you just go, you play with your um, sisters or brothers, it's su such a fragile thing. And to, to go through such a stressful situation of or getting cut old. and strapped <laughs> down and, and just, it's, it's terrible. I mean, even their bones are just, it seems like malleable, like they're just so, so fragile. So it's to Help, think about helpless, that. helpless, right? Yeah, and think absolutely about that. helpless. Yeah. Yeah, you never do that. Like if you had that baby in your hands, you would never do anything like that. And so it's, it right. became, it's like the abnormal becoming the normal. Right. Well, we also distance ourselves from it. So we use words like circumcision instead of, you know, penis cutting. Um, or, or, I mean, that's how the anti female genital cutting people got into the mainstream was to call female genital mutilation. So then you hear these, you know, so we, if, if, if what's got done to girls is female genital mutilation, what's, what are we doing to boys? That's not mutilation. That's circumcision. It's like, I, there, I read a book about, um, about concussions among football players. This was when the NFL stuff was starting to break and people would say boxers get concussions. Football players don't get concussions. Like, Really? <laughs> so females get mutilated, boys get circumcised because doctors do it, you know, like um, completely uh, insane denial about what we're doing. They should. And I'm, I'm telling you on Facebook, there's a, there are some groups that post, they, they really kind of tr troll the internet for, people who've posted pictures of their children after their babies, after circumcision. And, and they post the quote from the mother, the little man, you know, held up real well. And you see this picture of this <laughs> devastated baby, you know, not a little man, he's a baby. Right. Um, again, let me just mention again, intactamerica.org is our main website and tremendous amount of information there. 
uh, some things that are downloadable. We have Ask Marilyn. Marilyn Milos was the founder of the Intactivist Movement. She's a registered nurse. She knows more about penises. She could probably tell you about that scar. Um, <laughs> and uh, we have an Ask Marilyn column, which we publish weekly. Um, we have a Do You Know and our newsletter, which you can sign up for, where we tell interesting facts about circumcision. Then we also have circumcisiondebate.org, which is our light site. Um, and then all the social media. We have channels on all the social media, under, under including YouTube, under Intact America. We appreciate it, Georgianne. One last question for you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that guys can do that have been circumcised to regrow foreskin. I kind of read something that yep. guys can regrow foreskin. What? All right. Yes. Good question. It's called here. circumcision. It's called foreskin restoration. And if you Google it, a number of sites will come up. It basically involves stretching, stretching the remaining tissue. There's usually a little bit of foreskin and manually stretching. And there are all of these devices that have been invented to help stretch the foreskin and keep it in place as it's being stretched. And I'm not an expert in foreskin restoration. I don't know that many details, but I know many men uh, who have restored and you have to keep it up because if you, if you don't, I think the foreskin, you know, might retract again, but who are, I know, I know some men who said, I just couldn't, do it. It was too much work. I'm okay. And that's great. You know, I'm, I'm good. Uh, but I know many men who've done it, who said it's made a tremendous difference. If nothing else, it, um, as the foreskin starts to cover the head of the penis, the head of the penis gets restored to being moist and more sensitive, um, as it should be. Mm. So you might not have the, the for the restored foreskin doesn't have all those nerves that were taken away, but it definitely helps with intercourse, helps with um, lubricating and softening up the head, softening up the head of the penis. So, so take a look at it. Um, it's very interesting, and there, are, oh my goodness, uh, probably a dozen small companies. You know, these are mostly people working out of their basements, right? Just a cottage industry, but very effective, apparently. It was great. Well, Georgianne, we appreciate your time. We know you're, you you have a busy schedule, so we'll let you get back to it. Well, I can't thank you enough for having me on your program, your your podcast, and I um, I wish you the best. And uh, I'll come back anytime if you'd like me to. And in the meantime, take care of yourselves and remember: ten out of ten babies say no to circumcision. And sometimes, if you say that to someone, it's a little less aggressive than saying, "Why do you want to mutilate your son?" <laughs> well, <laughs> might thank be a little you. better. <laughs> we appreciate it, Georgian. You have a good day. Thanks. You too. Bye. 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 Bye.